Good evening, I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. Uh, this is the first of, in a sense, two talks that have to do with thinking about the future. Uh, Paul, in a way, is lucky to be going first because the next one is Nassim Nicholas Taleb doing The Black Swan. Uh, and Taleb is about, he'll be here Monday, February 4th, is about the huge events that, no matter how hard you try, you can't predict, and that change everything. And the way he comes to engaging that is by looking, he's a quant, he's a financial analyst, mathematical type, as well as Lebanese, as well as a great storyteller. And what he's doing is looking at the past in a certain way and trying to identify all the illusions that we use the past to think about the future with. Sappho, whose background is in studying the history of technology, also looks at the past, looking for all kinds of illusions with which we delude ourselves about the future. At a more micro, <clears throat> more micro scale than Taleb does, but there's interesting consistencies and apparent contradictions, but they're probably just paradoxical between the two. So let's start with Paul Sappho. Thank you, Stuart, and it's wonderful to be here. Um, and it is interesting to be on the stage ahead of Taleb because it's a funny thing. These things go in cycles. Um, but it is fashionable at the moment to make fun of futurists and forecasts and make great sport about how people's predictions and forecasts are terrible, which I have no objection to. I've done it myself for the better part of 25 years as a professional in the field, and I've even taken, pain, taken great pains not to call myself a, a futurist, which I will probably get around to explaining in a little bit. But, but let me start with a forecast. And, that, that was made a couple of years ago, and just analyze it a little bit. <laughs> Hunt for bin Laden. Experts agree. Al-Qaeda leader is dead or alive. Now, on the surface, this would look like a terrible forecast. In, in fact, I'm not even sure if it's a real forecast. This was courtesy of a jokester friend of mine, Yossi Vardy, who sent it my way, and I've never gotten CNN to admit if they actually did this. But let's assume it was a real forecast. I, you know, it's evocative, the complaint that one of our former presidents once said, please give me a one-handed economist. You know, none of this on the one hand, on the other hand thing. I would actually argue that this is not just a good forecast, this is a great forecast because it accurately and completely captured the uncertainty of that moment. The answer is he dead or alive beats me. That's what it says. And the biggest mistake a forecaster can mis make is to pretend to be more certain than in fact this fact suggest. And it goes even more deeply than that, and I think especially important today, this moment in time, this very uncertain moment in time where uncertainty just seems to be everywhere and the indicators head off in opposite directions. Take, take the financial markets. A few weeks ago, watching Gold and Google both go upwards, you know, and the question was which one would cross 850 first, 800 50 being the 30-year record high for gold. Uh, well, the spot on gold made it today. It hit $900. But, you know, it's a funny thing. Once upon a time, and in more simple and innocent times, um, if stock prices were high, like Google's price, that meant times were good. And if gold prices were high, like gold is at the moment, that meant times are bad. Both are high. Go figure. And then there's oil headed over $100, now it's under what happens next. The mortgage crisis, and anybody who's been 
uh, in Europe lately knows what the euro is doing and why you think twice before ordering a latte in Paris. These indicators are headed in opposite directions. And in my business as a forecaster, when change clusters at the extremes, it's a certain bet that much more fundamental change lies ahead. And I'll talk a little bit about what I think lies ahead tonight, but mostly what I want to do is share with you some tricks of the trade, some rules of thumb that I've learned over the last 25 years as a forecaster, and show you a little bit of how I approach dealing with looking at this uncertainty. And uncertainty really is the key element. Um, the way I think about it is you can take an event at a given moment in time, and extending outwards from that event is a cone of uncertainty. And the act of forecasting amounts to the act of mapping that cone of uncertainty. And it is an act of embracing uncertainty. And above all, by the way, it is an act that everybody should do. In these uncertain times, forecasting is more important than ever, and the biggest mistake you can make is to lead it, leave it to the experts. Everybody should forecast for themselves. And if you do that, regardless of the quality of your forecasts, you will be a more sophisticated consumer of the forecasts from the people who do it on a full-time basis. The trick with a cone of uncertainty, and, and by the way, the reason why it's a cone, it's pure common sense. In fact, everything I'm going to talk about tonight is common sense. And because it's common sense, very little of it is original. Um, think about the weather in San Francisco. Now, it's, our weather is not the best example, but you know, the cone 15 minutes out is fairly narrow. It's a safe bet, unless you live in Marin, uh, what the weather will be. But go out a day, the cone gets broader. And then after a couple of days, about three days, well, the curtain of good information falls, and it's like anyone's guess. So the essence of this is you're thinking about that spread of uncertainty that increases over time. And it begins with an event, and it forces you to think about just what the uncertainty really is. Uh, by the way, just a footnote, I forecast, I don't predict. You know, at a cocktail party, someone will come up and they say, so, you know, usually the question is, so how, how, are, how are your predictions done? Actually, the first question is, what stock should I buy? That's the most boring question. But the second one, and I start, it is a great conversation killer, because I say, I actually don't predict, I forecast. And that's about mapping a cone of uncertainty, and they find someone else to talk to. It works, <laughs> works every time. But in, it, uncertainty is not just an artifact of imperfect foresight. Uncertainty is intrinsic in the process, and in my opinion, it's very good news. Um, think about it, a world of uh, no uncertainty, a world in which you really or somebody could accurately predict, is a world that I don't think any of us would really want to live in. That's the world of a fundamentalist religious believer. God has a plan, it's all written out, but why bother? Because you can't change it. That's the world of the appointment in Samara. If you remember that old tale of the servant who goes to the souk in Samara and bumps into death in the marketplace, comes rushing home agitated and says to his master, 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 lend me your horse. I must flee to Baghdad. And the master says, why? He said, well, death was menacing me in the marketplace. So the servant rides off. The master goes into the marketplace, finds death. He's really easy to pick out, black hood, you know. Big. And says, dude, what are you doing messing with my servants? He said, I wasn't threatening your servant. I was just startled to see him because we have an appointment in, in Samara tonight. So, um, that's not the world we live in. This is a world of uncertainty, and that's good news because uncertainty is opportunity. Anybody who invests in the stock market, you know the worst market to invest in is a market where there's no changes. It's just painful if you call it wrong, but there, uncertainty and opportunity go together and in a perverse sort of way, that means this is the best of all possible times. Now, admittedly, you know, for some people, especially if you invested in subprime mortgages, saying that today is the best of all possible times is evocative of 
the immortal words of John Jacob Astor, who while sitting in the bar of the SS Titanic said, you know, I asked for ice, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> Nonetheless, the art of forecasting is understanding uncertainty and also balancing between a stance where if you look at things too narrowly, if you draw that cone too narrowly, you're going to miss things that happen. If you broad, draw it too broadly, you're going to spend your whole time navel-gazing around events that may never come to pass. And the art, what makes forecasting hard, isn't predicting the outcome. What makes forecasting hard is predicting the edges of the cone. And nobody, I've been saying this for 25 years, and nobody seems to get it. Maybe I just don't know how to talk. Here is a way to think about it. Wild cards are an especially effective method to do this. And this is the first of a couple of rules. I, I did an article in Harvard Business Review, and I've pulled a little bit out of this, but out of respect for you all, I've thrown out a bunch of stuff I didn't do, put into HBR. Think about wild cards. You know, Peter Schwartz, a brilliant futurist, is fond of remarking that the difference between a good forecast and reality is that a good forecast has to be believable and internally consistent. And of course, reality labors under no such constraints. Um, and, and one way to think about that, the unlikely, the outlandish, and the like, is to turn them into wild cards. Wild cards are a permissible way to think crazy ideas without getting ridiculed. Um, and, and there are all sorts of ways to think about wild cards, but the bottom line is that wild cards test the edge of the cone. They define the ragged edge of plausibility of any good forecast. So think about wild cards and, and think about people who do it well. John Peterson at the Arlington Institute on the East Coast is a brilliant thinker about wild cards. But of course, the daily newspaper is a great source of wild cards. And, and just being a smarty pants is not a bad idea. I remember when we started the recall campaign for governor, long before Schwarzenegger appeared on scene, and I was talking to a journalist friend on the East Coast, and I called him up and I said, you know, we're, we're having a recall campaign again, and we've had one of these ever since Hiram Johnson ran for governor, but I just have this feeling this one's going to work. And you know, with our damn luck, we're going to get another damn movie actor as governor. He thinks I'm a genius. I was just being a smart ass. <laughs> and of course, the amazing part about that wild card is not only did we get a governor, an ex-movie actor as governor, he's a great governor. Go figure. So, you know, the difference, or at least a pretty good governor. Um, uh, so the bottom line is think about wild cards and look around in all sorts of places. I find they, they pop out in in the odd sorts of spots, but, but also bad forecasts, really bad forecasts, can be really great wild cards. This is a magazine, it was one of my favorite magazines. In fact, it was my most favorite magazine until the advent of Wired, which was kind of an act of unrequited love because it lasted exactly one issue. As I said, there hasn't been a magazine like this one until now, and there wasn't one after. It was around 1970, they didn't put a date on it, uh, so I can't, but you can judge, that's a, the age by the picture, that's a very young Al Toffler before he wrote Future Shock. Go, so, so bad magazines with lurid forecasts are a great place to look for good wild cards. And in this, they had a special, because it was like 1969, 1970, they had a newspaper from 1984, and there was a want ad section in it, for 1984, genetic engineer, need MS in biochemistry and lab experience, will be editing and composing genetic, i.e. DNA, because people didn't know about codes for babies. Skinner Community Hospital, Watson Avenue. This was, you know, this was a good seven years before the first uh, issue of biotechnology appeared on screen. The other ones are pretty good too. Attractive girls with good personalities and basic office skills needed for film about sexism in the 70s. <laughs> it's wonderful stuff and I must admit I look at this uh, old magazine more often than you might imagine. Wild cards sensitize us to surprise. They help us kind of get in underneath 
the current of the zeitgeist and get a sense of what's going on. And by the way, there is one other source I should mention, not just for wild cards, but, but for forecasts, and that's science fiction. Science fiction, people have real arguments about whether it's a good place for forecasting. It's actually one of the few things that will actually give you predictive power, because it turns out science, science fiction ends up being this idea bomb. It's a meme bomb that goes into the head of teenagers. And they carry that idea through school, ignoring their professors and ignoring their bosses until they reach middle age and they get the opportunity to finally carry out their dreams, which they got from reading science fiction. And that's how we got cyberspace. Bill Gibson uh, you know, uh, famously wrote about it in a novel, and the people who read it, when they got into the business world, that's what they made. And the atomic scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project were all influenced by H.G. Wells, and um, many of the astronauts in the Mercury program grew up on space opera. So science fiction is actually a really interesting special case of how to look ahead, uh, because you can see what people's dreams are, and they'll eventually get a chance to do it. But go back to this notion of surprise. Things surprise us for a very simple reason, and that is change is never linear. At least interesting change is never linear. Even in here, in Silicon Valley, what surprises me is that the future constantly arrives late and in unexpected ways. In fact, the secret in Silicon Valley is most ideas take 20 years to become an overnight success. And they do so because change looks like this. It's an S-curve. It's the curve of Moore's Law. We all know the doubling period of chips, and it's led to all the marvels we have. All sorts of consumer devices. Television followed an S-curve pattern from invention in, in the 1930s to take off in the 1950s. The Internet itself followed an S-curve. I mean, the Internet was almost exactly 20 years old in 1987, the year Al Gore invented it, when it started to take off. So S-curves are everywhere. They are all around us. And as a forecaster, in general, a safe posture is things are going to arrive late. And, and I'll, the, the other half of that statement, uh, I will spoil a slide a few points ahead. If everybody thinks something's around the corner, take the posture of, no, 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 it's, it's further out. And then if they all say, it'll never arrive, you can say it's about to come. Guarantee. That's a safe default position. But, but let me give you an example, because inflection points are tiptoeing past us all the time. But the problem is, this is how we generally look at the future. We, even in Silicon Valley, people draw the future as a straight line. And meanwhile, things go here. And it's because we don't like change and, and a few other details about why that flat spot's so flat. But let me give you an example of an inflection point tiptoeing past us right now. Um, this is a picture I shot in May 2004 at the first DARPA Grand Challenge. This is the robotic race across the desert, 150 miles, 21 teams qualified, and, and I was there at the start, and this is sort of what happened at the start. It was like Monty Python. 21 teams, all but four vehicles died in the chutes or at the gate, and, and this one was my favorite, his little R2-D2 kind of guy comes out the Jersey barriers, it gets to the entrance, it pauses, it looks left, it looks right, it thinks about it a bit, and it hangs a hard left and dies in a coyote bush <laughs> 20 feet from the gate. The robot that got furthest was this one, Sandstorm, from Carnegie Mellon. Here it is. Yeah, you lost, dudes. Uh, <laughs> get over it. Uh, but it's a nice vehicle, and, and you won't whistle when you see the next picture. Uh, so it's, and, and by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with the race, so this is a Humvee with a LiDAR unit on the, on the roof, and behind it is a truck with three dudes in it, and one dude's driving, and one dude's got his thumb on a kill switch. At the moment the robot misbehaves, he like, oh, you're dead. There was one, a huge military vehicle that was the scariest thing I've ever seen that they really had to shut down, but uh, I don't want to pound on it. So the next picture is Sandstorm, you know, I kept trying to think, what's the punchline to why did the robot cross the road, but I can't recall. This is um, a picture of it crossing the road moments before it drove through a fence, 
If, people, if those people had known, they would have been stepping about 50 feet farther back. And that little inset picture is sandstorm stuck on the side of the road where it died uh, 7.4 miles into the race. Now, I was part there as part of a medical support team, and we were uh, halfway on the race out in the desert feeling pretty darn foolish because there was nothing near us. But now, jump, and, and only four, four robots got out of the gates. Jump ahead 18 months later, and here's the finish of the second race. The grand challenge number two, and that is Stanley from Stanford, and is a part-time consulting professor at Stanford. I'm glad to say the Stanford team won, but I will, in the interest of the Carnegie Mellon folks in back, admit it's not so much that Stanford won, but Carnegie Mellon uh, lost, uh, <laughs> and only by a small amount. Uh, it's off topic, but let me explain it for software developers in the room. Sandstorm Carnegie Mellon team leader is Red Whitaker. Red's an ex-Marine. Let me correct myself. Red's a Marine. There is no such thing as an ex-Marine. He believes in hot hardware, thinks good hardware is more important than good software. Sebastian Thrun, who led the Stanford team, and by the way, we at Stanford stole Sebastian from the Carnegie Mellon team and moved him out to Stanford where he's the head of the AI lab. Um, believes in really good software and will make up for bad software. Sandstorm was kicking uh, uh, the Stanford uh, vehicle all the way until a bolt came loose and that LIDAR unit on the top of it started wobbling and it got really bad astigmatism and it was crawling along and Stanley went roaring past. Um, there, the difference on this race though is there were 23 finalists entering the race 22 of the robots got farther than Sandstorm got in the first race, and five of them finished. Does that look like an S-curve to you? That's an inflection point, that kind of 18-month jump. I'll go in back into that, but here is the lesson of all of this. Our tendency is to overestimate short-term change because of our inflated hopes and expectations. And when cold reality fails to conform to our inflated expectations, we do the opposite. We underestimate the long-term implications. This is why, this is the only slide that would argue against being a forecaster. Ordinary people get to be wrong once. The internet arrives and they go, where'd that come from? Forecasters and visionaries and software developers and the like uh, get to be wrong twice because they stand at the start and they say, oh, I see the future, it's just around the corner. And then they stand around. Of course, in Silicon Valley, I should add, we don't draw this as an S-curve. In the valley, it's a J-curve. Things, you know, just keep going upwards forever. Um, Garrett Gruner's in the audience. He'll appreciate that this is why venture capitalists sleep like babies. They sleep for two hours, wake up and cry. So now one way, and, and, and I should add that the, the, the most elegant statement of this I ever heard was when I was a young child uh, living here in California, kind of in a, a, a ruralish part of the state, and there was a rancher who said to me, son, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. And that's the best forecasting advice anybody has ever given me, and I pass it on in the spirit of sharing. Never mistake a clear view for a short distance. Things will always arrive late and in completely unexpected ways. Now, one way to avoid being blindsided by this nonlinear pattern of the S-curve is to look for indicators. Bill Gibson, the novelist, put it very nicely at a conference here that Kevin Kelly organized many years ago. Um, he said, you know, the future's already arrived. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And he's absolutely right. And if you think about that, you know, the way, the way good forecasters do it is we look for things happening in the present and we extrapolate out. And you get tuned to those weird little things that don't fit, that seem out of place and kind of stick in your mind. Of course, some of them are hugely obvious. The Keeling curve. I mean, we all deserve a collective dope slap for missing this one. I mean, the numbers were there. The first report I saw that, that talked about global climate change was a NOAA report. Uh, done as an expert study in uh, about 1977, and we still ignored it. But there are other things that are really good indicators, and doctors have a great term for this. Generally, I don't use Latin in my speeches. Ever since I, 
I, I, a friend, a historian pointed out to me, uh, after Churchill died, they were looking through his papers, and in the margins of one of his speeches, it was written, he'd written to himself, speech week here, use Latin and shout. But, <laughs> in fact, come to think of it, I'm not using Latin, I'm using Greek. Uh, the word prodrome uh, it means roughly running ahead. It's an indicator. Now, if a doctor tells you that he sees a prodrome, that's not good news. You don't want your doctor to talk to you about prodromes. But think about prodromes of indicators, things running ahead of the actual event. One of my favorites, because I was lucky enough to notice it at the time, was on the, in January 1985 on the Usenet, which then was an extraordinarily obscure thing, this, this guy named Spencer Bowles said, I just found an interesting software problem. Of course we're going to solve it. Well, the interesting software problem was what we went on to call Y2K. Um, we knew about it then. Uh, it was written up in Computer World that spring. You know, it was floating around, but nobody took it seriously until about, you know, October 1999. <laughs> so these things are all around if you just look for them. Good indicators, the best indicators, are things that don't seem to fit, they don't make sense, or they're just really weird. And, and if you look at it that way, you see them everywhere. I was flipping through the examiner two days ago, and there was a little thing buried on page 14, San Mateo Police Department puzzled by homemade bombs. And I thought, oh, I so hope that's not an indicator. But I can't get it out of my mind. Um, but let me give you a happier example. This is the Roomba. How many people here have a Roomba? Okay. What's the name of your Roomba, sir? You doesn't have, who ha okay, it's great. You know, next time I'm going to do a plant in the audience. Forget you. Let me tell you what I found. In 2003, the Roomba came out, and something very strange started happening. I have a lot of geek friends, you know, and they've got 128K Max. Well, I did too. And, and, and all of a sudden, I noticed some of my engineer geek friends were totally stoked about their new robotic vacuum cleaner. And I thought, well, this is odd. These are people who I don't even recall owning a vacuum cleaner. And they're excited about it, and I started checking more, and I talked to the company, and they said, yeah, you know, we're seeing this really weird thing, too. Two-thirds of Roomba owners, we've discovered, given their Roombas names. And I thought, I don't remember anybody giving a vacuum cleaner a name. And then, a more amazingly, one-third of Roomba owners confessed to having taken their Roomba vacuum cleaners on vacation with them, <laughs> or over to a friend's house. Well, folks... That's a screaming indicator uh, that something is going on in the robotic space. And I'll build on that in a second. But then there are just those indicators that are really weird coincidences. Um, the third DARPA Grand Challenge on 3rd November 2007, um, and the Carnegie Mellon team won it. They finally caught up to Stanford, and they won the race. Um, but, uh, and this was the Urban Grand Challenge. It was uh, started at uh, 8 a.m. on, um, I'm trying to remember, it was November 3rd, and uh, it was about 250, uh, or I guess about a 100-mile race, and they had to drive around town, and they had to know the vehicle codes, and all this stuff, and, and, and it, it was a good race, you know, the, the, the robots actually performed, but here's the indicator. At almost the exact same moment that this race began, this is what happened on Highway 99, 250 miles to the north. A whole bunch of people in cars, over a hundred cars. In the end, I believe it was um, uh, 108 cars and 18 big rigs smashed into each other, like salmon going upstream in the fog. The firemen working the front of the accident said they could hear the cars pounding into the back at the end. At the very same time that the robots were taking off, people were doing this. Okay, what's the indicator? People shouldn't drive. <laughs> people shouldn't drive. It's crazy that people drive. And if you ask Sebastian Thrun, he agrees. And in fact, his forecast is by the year 2030, half of all vehicle miles in this country will be driven by autonomous robots which sounds really unlikely until you look at this and you think at the very moment we demonstrated 250 miles to the south that we already have robots that understand the California Vehicle Code better than anybody in this room. So these indicators are absolutely everywhere. But one other detail, if you miss an indicator, 
don't worry. You got time. If you miss that Usenet announcement in 1985, you had until 1991, 92, 93 to get onto the bandwagon and write your book about the Y2K price because nobody else was watching it. Change is slow. It's uneven. It's slow at the start and then it becomes very fast. So oftentimes you can go back and mine history for the indicators. So long as you do this. Look back. Look back twice as far as you're looking forward. Mark Twain is alleged to observe, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And he's absolutely right, even though he didn't really say it. There are also people who say, God darn it, you forecasters, you know, you use a rear view mirror to look into the future. Well, I'm here to tell you, a rear view mirror is a damn good forecasting tool if you use it in the right way, because besides, it's really the only tool we have. So if you really do look back at history in the right way, it is enormously informative. They're also, you know, the latest fashionable term in forecasting, because forecasters don't get any better, um, but they keep changing the term and hoping people remember, you know, forget their bad history. So there was a brief, horrible period where they were called futurologists. We're glad that died. And then there are futurists, doesn't quite die. And then there are, you know, people like me who weasel with the word forecaster. The latest term du jour is foresight, as, you know, somehow it makes it more respectable. So you have all these little foresight institute things coming up and back. Well, if you want to do good foresight, you better do good backsight. Backsight is the secret to foresight. Look back, and what you can see is that random little indicators will suddenly line up into a very powerful beacon looking at the future. Now, I've been hinting about a robot trend. Let me give you some context. It turns out about every decade or so, an enabling technology arrives that sets the entrepreneurial landscape. And the technology that shaped the 80s that arrived in the late 70s was the microprocessor. But people didn't think about buying microprocessors. They bought personal computers. It was a revolution because now we could have computers on our desks. So the 1980s was a processing decade enabled by the arrival of cheap microprocessors, and the poster child was the personal computer. The, and the 90s, however, were shaped by a fundamentally different technology. And by the way, in my defense, this was a forecast I actually made back then, and so I, and the documentation's on my webpage. The 90s were shaped by the communications laser, which built on top of the processing uh, power that already existed. And cheap lasers gave us optical storage, uh, CD-ROM, and most importantly, they gave us fiber optic bandwidth. And that was the ac ac access decade. Our devices were no longer defined by what they processed for us. They were defined by what they connected us to. And by the way, these are little tiny S-curve events that, uh, that, that happened and got established and brought some real surprises in. This decade is being shaped by a fundamentally different technology. It's not the microprocessor, it's not the laser, it's the arrival. Oh, and by the way, indicators of the laser decade. I shot this on a street in San Francisco in 1992. Uh, by the way, if you're looking for indicators in traffic, watch both, look both ways first. I almost got hit when I took this. I went, oh, wow, cool, you know, I got to get a picture of it. But these things are what cause the surprise. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, the future tends to arrive in unexpected ways. You know, think about how the Internet came in as a total surprise to so many people. Um, in fact, here in 1987, there were people who talked about, um, uh, about the, the fiber optics uh, and, and giving us uh, optical storage on disk, and books were dead. So now, just for a moment, place yourself in 1987. And the wise people, Bill Gates was saying, we have a CD-ROM revolution coming, and, and we're going to have hypertext and entire books on, on, on disk and, and get over bookstores. They're, you know, they're going to sell you electronic books, paper books are dead. There were a few maniacs running around like Ted Nelson and, and some of Doug Engelbart's alums saying, no, no, we need a global ubiquitous hyper document system where everything's connected to everything and you don't have to go to stores. And they said, that's very nice, maybe in 50 years. The training wheels for that are 
CD-ROM and, and hypertext on disk. But imagine saying to someone in 1987, um, little kids, long before the year 2000, little kids will come home from school, turn on their computers, log on to a server in Tokyo, download the latest images of their favorite Japanese anime cartoon characters over what? That thing you thought was 50 years away, the ubiquitous global hyperdocument system, arrived in 1994. It was the World Wide Web. Oh, and by the way, it triggered the largest explosion in consumer spending in 40 years. And what was the hottest thing being sold? Books. They would have locked you up as a dangerous crazy. <laughs> this decade, however, is being shaped by an unno a very unnoticed technology, and that's cheap sensors. We are in the middle of a vast sensor revolution of things that are, you know, like RFID. This is a wonderful slide from a company that went out of business. You know, they, people talk about RFID as a substitute for barcode. It may be, but for God's sake, that is the least important implication here. We think about it this way. In the 80s, we created our computers. In the 90s, we networked them together. And now in this decade, we are giving them eyes, ears, and sensory organs. And what's the only thing missing from that? put wheels on the darn things in their robots. I am here to tell you that I will, and I'm not, well, I'm going to phrase this a different way because I know what Stuart will do to me. The next big thing is robots. It, the next big thing to come out of nowhere and everybody's going, to, oh my God, where did that come from? And I couldn't live without that. I didn't know it existed, is robots. I don't know how far off it is, but it's not too far into the future. And when you look at this context from history, it's, it's crushingly, inexorably obvious. By the way, robots may be the next big thing. They're not the only big thing. Um, sensors pop up in other places. You're putting sensors in your running shoes. I'm sure people here have this. This is the new Nike shoe. It's got a wireless link. Your shoes talk to your, um, uh, your, your iPod, and if you slow down, the shoes say, hey, the dude's slowing down. Switch to the inspirational music. It plays Rocky. <laughs> And, and, and this is an indicator, too, of another shift, by the way. I mean, this is not an evening where I really wanted to talk about forecasts, but I can't resist. Um, today, the web is synonymous with people accessing information. You know, it's get on there and you surf around. Once upon a time, the telecommunications network in this country was about people talking to other people. And today, that's such a small fraction of what the telecommunications network does. They can give you phone service for free over the internet. The same thing is about to happen to the web. The future of the web is not people accessing information. It's machines accessing information. It's machines generating information. And in the same way that a fraction of 1% of telecommunications traffic is attributable to voice today, in a decade or so, you will see the same thing happen to the web, where most of the web viewing is done by machines, and most of the data is being generated by machines. But pushing onward, another good way to see indicators is to cherish failure, preferably other people's failure. Remember that flat spot on the S-curve? Really and truly, most ideas take 20 years to become an overnight success in Silicon Valley because we fail our way into the future. And by the way, the Valley is damn good at failing. The Valley is built on the rubble of failure, not the spires of earlier success. Think about why did the web take off in Silicon Valley? After all, it was invented on the Swiss-French border by an English boffin who thought he was designing groupware for physicists. Well, it took off here because a whole industry was collapsing just before the web arrived, the interactive TV industry, and it left a whole bunch of programmers out of a job, but they'd been sensitized to rich media and video and the like, and they're literally standing on a street corner going, gee, what do I do next? The, they see the web and they go, cool. The first, uh, you know, the first really big web development company, U.S. Web, its first office of any size was a building it rented from Apple at below market rates, and Apple said, oh, you can have the contents too. It was the Apple Interactive TV Studio. But let me give you another recent example of an interesting failure. This is from 1985. How many people here are on Second Life? Show of hands. This is where it started. This is the first graphical MUD, multiple user dimension. Habitat from Lucasfilm in 1985. Wasn't around for long, but basically did everything that you do in, in Second Life, except very slowly. 
Um, and it was followed by failure after failure after failure. And then sure enough, you know, in the almost, uh, almost 20 years, we get second life and the takeoff. The lesson here, anybody who's doing investment or, 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 or you want to start a company, you want a short-term win, you don't want to wait for 20 years, look for something that's been failing for 20 years and everybody has said, it ain't ever going to happen. And chances are that's the thing that will take off. This rule is the hardest. Be indifferent. As a for I'm a forecaster, not a futurist, because I am a professional bystander. Futurists are advocates about the future. Inevitably, you scratch a futurist, and beneath their policy talk, they are passionate about something. Personal, personal helicopters or rocket ships or preserving their, their brain in a computer or something. <laughs> That's fine to be excited about the future. It's fine to be an advocate, but engage in cognitive dissonance. When you're making the forecast, detach what you wish would happen from what you think is likely to happen because you get excited, you arbitrarily narrow the cone, and you are in a deep, a deep trouble. It results in diminished appreciation of uncertainty and oftentimes in just plain old-fashioned irrational behavior, like Christian fundamentalists who believe in the end of the world. Now, I don't know for sure that the world won't end. Uh, but I do know there are some people who believe that the world will end, and they're trying to do everything they can to make it happen. Um, these people have been wrong for 2,000 years, and it doesn't seem to bother them that they have the worst forecasting record of anyone around. But being wrong, I must add, can still be very profitable. Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth outsold every book in the 1980s except the Holy Bible. So, but this is also useful because if you think about indicators being everywhere, the folly of other fools can be a very powerful indicator that something was going on. And you can take these and stick them together, take multiple events. When I, once I thought about Y2K for a while, around 1989-1990, after the harmonic convergence of August 1987, which was the happy end of the world, the Branch Davidians in 1993, the unhappy end of the world, and Heaven's Gate, you know, they were way off in 1997, the unhappy end, there was, it was cruel, but there was a bumper sticker that read, so, many, so few comets, so many stupid people. Um, and, and a whole industry has emerged, <laughs> people doing these crazy books. But what was obvious to me in the early 90s is, forget your computer, forget Y2K. The bug in our computer was nothing compared to the software bug in our culture of all of these people who absolutely believed this stuff and built an industry around it. And also, if you look at the history of millennial movements, the biggest impact of the prophecy happens after the prophecy has failed to come to pass. And if we had thought hard about that, we would have understood what was going on. An indicator that I didn't figure out but set off alarm bells for me was the bombing of the, of the Buddha by the Taliban in Afghanistan. When that happened in spring before 9-11, I was calling friends at the State Department and elsewhere saying, I don't get it, but this is a big deal. Something's going on. There is a, there's something happening in the zeitgeist. I didn't figure it out. but. By the way, Tom Clancy did, you know, he wrote a novel five years before the fact that had a, uh, a 747 flown into the White House by an angry Japanese pilot, not by those others. This is also an indicator that, in my opinion, speaks to the circumstances today. We are still, we are surrounded by millennial crisis cults, whether it's the Taliban, whether it is fundamentalist Christians trying to uh, use recombinant DNA to create a red heifer in Jerusalem to accelerate the second coming. In my opinion, the single largest factor affecting global politics today is the cultural effect of the millennium, and nobody's talking about it. But let me push on to another rule. Assume you are wrong whenever you make a forecast and forecast often. If you must forecast, go back, look at your forecast, and be ruthless about knowing where you are wrong. Good forecasting is the inverse of traditional good research. A good researcher will spend a lot of time, you know, carefully looking at the data, holding off, coming to a theory, and then finally reach a point 
where he can come to a conclusion and then ignore everything else that doesn't match the conclusion. As a forecaster, I can never have 100% information, so I do the opposite. I come to a conclusion as quickly as I can, and then I set out to demonstrate why I'm wrong, because I know if I don't do it, somebody else will explain it to me. The consequences of the failure to forecast often were sadly, but dramatically, demonstrated. On September 8, 1923, on the coast of California, south of here a couple hundred miles. This boat, this destroyer, the USS Chauncey, did not make it to San Diego. It was on a engineering run just after Fleet Week in San Francisco as part of Squadron 11 Destroyer Force Battle Fleet. This is back in the old days when destroyers huddled together. There were 14 four stackers going in a line down the coast. And, um, they ended up on the rocks because of a particular kind of forecasting error. Actually, only nine ships made it aground. Uh, the others made it uh, offshore, and here's the story of why. They were going down the coast, cruising at about 20 knots. It's a lee shore. Sailors know that's a dangerous thing. There was foggy weather, there was wind astern, but they were using what's known as dead reckoning, uh, which you kind of guess at your position in the water uh, navigators know what this is. For lay people, uh, dead reckoning, as one Navy skipper explained to me, he says, that's, that's navigation by gosh and by golly and by God. And their calculated position is, is where the dotted line starts there. This is the California coast just beyond Santa Barbara where the channel turns in uh, towards Los Angeles. And so they thought they were in just about the right spot where they should be turning in. This area, by the way, is known as the graveyard of the Pacific, at least to California sailors. And the trick here is you better make the turn right because if you go in a straight line, you're going to hit San Miguel Island, which they were very worried about that day because just that morning, a passenger ship, the Cuba, grounded on San Miguel Island and one of the other destroyers, the USS Reno, sailed to its rescue. And so I said, for God's sake, let's not miss the turn. They were aware of the risk. They were also knew it was high uncertainty in their position, but they were guys, and they were reluctant to slow down <laughs> because they were on an engineering run trying to get a record. Well, they had some other technology. They had a good forecasting tool. It was a radio station at Point Arguello Light, station NPK, that would, you would radio them, and they would radio the bearing that you were on. The skipper of the lead boat, Lieutenant Commander Hunter requested bearings. And they said, you are at 333 degree, degrees. That was consistent with the earlier bearings they'd gotten, and his navigator, Lieutenant Blodgett, trusted the radio direction finder. Uh, but Commander Hunter was a little old-fashioned, and he was skeptical of this newfangled radio thing. And more importantly, the bearing that they gave him did not match his fix that he had made by dead reckoning. And he thought, well, if it doesn't match my position, it should be wrong. This is kind of like Heaven's Gate, folks. Heaven's Gate went down to Oceanside Telescope and bought a Celestron C-11 to look at Comet Hale-Bopp so they could see the spaceship flying in behind the comet um, that was going to carry them off this planet. They took it home, they set it up, and they didn't see the spaceship. So what did they do? they returned the telescope because obviously it was defective. <laughs> now, it's not quite that bad, but the immortal words of Lieutenant Commander Hunter, his instructions to Sparks, his radio man, quote, impossible bearing. Tell them we're south of Arguello, damn it. Ask them for the reciprocal bearing. The reciprocal bearing, in those days, a radio beam kind of, you can either say, well, you're 333 degrees or the other way. And he said, ah. 168 degrees, two miles east of my assumed position, but that ain't so bad coming down the California coast. And he issued the fateful order, at 2100 hours, change course to 095 degrees. That was their actual position. For those of you who don't know what 095 degrees is, that's a hard left turn into the coastline. The die was cast. In fact, the original bearing was right. Meanwhile, what happened was 
The Delphi's navigator wasn't the only one harboring doubts. The 11th boat back, uh, oh, by the way, one of those wonderful ironies of forecasting, the lead boat was called the Delphi. <laughs> you know, as a forecaster, I just pray for coincidences. Like, so the 11th boat back, the Kennedy, the navigator there had doubts, and he violated Navy doctrine. There were two violations of Navy doctrine that night. The first one by the navigator, he listened to the radio bearings being sent to the Delphi. Under destroyer doctrine at the time, only the navigator in the lead boat was allowed to navigate, and it was against doctrine for the other guys to even listen in. He listened in, he was plotting it, he was saying, we're not where they think we are. And he kept tugging the arm of his skipper, Commander Roper, he said, we're not there. Roper agrees, and Roper makes the second violation of the evening, which almost ruined his career. Destroyer doctor at the time is the boats followed each other. And you always followed the boat in front of you. And you never varied off that because they had really thin skins. And the only safety for destroyers was to stick close together and shoot all at once. He, as the Delphi executed its hard left turn onto the coast, Roper says, I'm not so sure. We're going to delay the turn and kind of scooch a little out. And sure enough, they then saw the other ships piling up. He turned out to see he led the remaining ships to safety. He was court-martialed. <laughs> the lesson, part of the lesson is, if you want a piece of California geography named after you, drive your destroyer onto the beach. The mistake is immortalized as destroyer rock just off the California coast. But the real lesson here is about uncertainty. When the Delphi skipper hit the rocks along with those nine other destroyers, it happened because he narrowed his cone of uncertainty at the very moment that the data was screaming to widen it, to hedge his bets, and to hold off and just see what the future would bring. And his mistake is mis memorialized on this chart for all the rest of us. So unless you want to get your name on a rock somewhere, and if you really want to understand uncertainty, the lesson above all is this. Embrace uncertainty in all of its complexity and gut-wrenching portent of change. Uncertainty is our friend. Uncertainty is opportunity. And the last piece of advice is to really understand uncertainty. You must face change head on. And what I love, being tuned to indicators elsewhere, I didn't even have to do a PowerPoint because I found the indicator, the best advice I've found for forecasting in as long as I can remember, on the counter of one of my favorite espresso bars, barely 20 blocks from here, and it read this. <laughs> Hooray for tips. Oops, not that part. If you fear change, leave it in here. That is my advice. Embrace uncertainty. If you fear change, leave it in here. Thank you. Where would you like me, Stuart? <laughs> That's fabulous. Okay, smartass. <laughs> I'm leaving now. What's your cone of uncertainty on climate change? Um, uh, yeah, could you narrow? I mean, that's a big topic. You mean, is it real? Okay, well, here's why I look at it. Okay. Yes, we know climate change is real. There's no question about that unless you're a conservative Republican. Um, we also have very strong evidence that it is anthropogenic. It's caused by people and not, as Russian whack, whacked out scientists say, by changes in solar patterns. Um, but here's the interesting question. I think the climate change has not yet begun. It's not over. It hasn't yet begun. Those are the two easy questions. The hard question and the real uncertainty around it is, what do we do? And what I see happening, I, I'm a, I write a column for ABC News, and the indicator that alerted me to this was a little company that um, wants to solve climate change by sprinkling iron filings, rust in the Pacific, to cause a plankton bloom and it captures carbon. They're nice folks, they're very sincere. As far as I can tell, it's just a way for making money on the stock market. But I think what's happening 
is this third question is dividing up into two camps. And it sort of ties to that millennial thing. The first camp, call them Druids, are people who say, we got to solve this problem by going lighter on the land, backing off, getting things back in equilibrium. The second group, call them engineers, say, no, 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 we got to go faster. We got to do solar shades. Uh, and of course, now, now, now we're not doing solar shades, we're doing plants. If you read last week's New Scientist, the study is you got to grow stuff on the ground, solar shades cause other problems. Here's the problem we all, the rest of us have. I'm, I'm waffly right in the middle. I have not made up my mind one way or another. Frankly, I think they're both wrong. You know, it reminds me of, of, of Henry Kissinger in the first few days of the Arab-Israeli war, and someone said, Dr. Kissinger, who would you like to see win? And he paused and he said, it would be nice if both sides lost. Um, <laughs> the uncertainty is around who wins, the Druids or the engineers, and let's hope that debate is resolved in a sensible way. A good friend of mine, by the way, is hard at work on a book that sort of touches on this subject, so hurry up and finish it, Stuart. And then I'll talk about it. Um, the whole climate debate largely is going in and around the most complicated and ambitious models in the world. And people are criticizing the models for being jumped up weather models. Other people like Jim Lovelock are saying it doesn't have the biota in there. I suppose people at Santa Fe Institute are saying there's not enough complex adaptive uh, agents wandering around in there. But models are a major predictive tool that a lot of people use. What's your position on models? Well, the effect of us, the, the other problem between the druids and the engineers is druids tend to be earth scientists and biologists. You know, an earth scientist is fundamentally a pessimist that no matter what you do, eventually the mountain's going to erode into the sea. In contrast, engineers uh, tend to be, by nature, optimists. There is no problem that, throwing, that you can't solve by throwing enough money and resources and smarts at, and that's the argument. And I think the value of the models depends, because the pessimists view the models differently than the optimists. Um, the thing I find fascinating, by the way, in forecasting today is we're on a moment where the models are getting really good because of the combination of computer power with Moore's Law and the algorithms, and you see what the quants did on Wall Street. They're revving their stuff and making it better all the time. It's starting to leak outwards, and frankly, as a forecaster, and you know, forecaster futurist, call you what you want, you know, I, I, I expect I will be replaced by a machine someday, and it'll do a better job. So when the sensors get linked up to the models and they both get smarter in terms of each other, then we get a takeoff. That's what we get. Sensors everywhere, plus the computers, plus the networks, you start getting, you know, all I know is our models better get a lot better real soon, because we don't have a lot of time. A uh, question from, it looks like, Marga Novotny. Want to raise your hand? Where are you? Over here, it looks like. How do you gather and organize the indicators you notice? In other words, what is your methodology for keeping track of them? <laughs> I don't have a good methodology yet. Um, I always carry a camera with me. Uh, I keep a good old-fashioned paper journal. Um, I collect stuff on the internet. What? Where is your journal? We can wave it at people. It's down in my bag. Okay. Um, he has an amazing journal, which I'm trying to persuade Stanford uh, which they probably will to keep because it's the best record of these years we'll have. So, well, uh, who knows? Uh, I just remember when Stewart gave his papers to Stanford, somebody promptly wrote a book about him. There's no danger in that case, but as he said, the book was, quote, shockingly accurate because of it. So <laughs> That's the problem. I'm on the Stanford Library Board in that capacity. Please give your papers to Stanford, but remember what happened. Um, I, don't have, I don't have a settled method. Um, the most important thing is, is a frame of mind. I never stop, you know, it, it drives my poor suffering spouse at times crazy. Um, I can remember years ago, the laser decade example, um, we were driving up the coast of Mendocino, it was right when emergency call boxes had started appearing on the roadside. And right at the Mendocino line, there was a sign that said, end emergency call boxes. And I went, that is damn strange. And I got off the freeway at the next exit, drove south, came on, took a picture of it, and I basically ruined our weekend in Mendocino because I kept going, what does that mean? <laughs> and then finally I realized what it meant. 
Normally, until that point, those of you in the room are old enough to remember, if you're driving on a road, you were assuming you were in a zone of no communications. Unless someone put up a sign and said, you can communicate here, it said pay phone, add dime. Our world had changed thanks to the laser that we now assumed we were in a zone of communications to such a degree that Caltrans felt compelled to put up a sign saying, warning, you're welcome to keep driving further north, but don't blame us if you can't get a payphone. And by the way, six months later when I drove that road, the sign was gone because they went all the way up the highway. And then more recently, if you notice, they started to disappear because we all have cell phones. If you just keep thinking about it all the time, the indicators are there. Use paper, you know, paper folders, computers, files, whatever. Just collect them any way you can. Okay, I got two good ones from Jaime Casio's right here. Have you ever made a forecast? You later came to regret not because you were wrong, but because people who listened to you made bad, tragic, or mistaken decisions. Um, there confession. is, in fact, something worse than, it, it's not quite that. This is the lament of Cassandra, you know, don't fall in love, or, you know, you know if, 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 if a god, you know, I, I don't believe in sexual harassment, but if a god puts the moves on you, for God's sake, say yes, because if you jilt them, they really screw up your life, which is what happened when Apollo said to Cassandra, I give you the gift of perfect foresight but I give you the curse that no one will believe you. Now, you might think that is, uh, you know, that just having people believe your forecast and do something wrong is bad. It's worse when they don't believe you, you know, and, and they come back to you and say, oh, woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, shoulda taken your advice. That hurts because it's your fault. That's the most painful. So add to that, what, how do you, hmm. you watch that happen a number of times, and then what do you learn about being more persuasive? Well, you know, at Global Business Network, you all were very cunning and effective at this. It's all about reports. I mean, there are sometimes you write a report, sometimes you give a presentation. Uh, there was an instance I know where the way they did the report, they wrote it as a novel and got it to everyone, and it got to everyone except this one vice president, and they gave the novel to his wife and got him that way. So you have to be very, very cunning, and, and also, it's, it's about shaking people out of the present. Gary Snyder, in one of his poems, has a marvelous pa passage where he talks about a Tibetan army knife with patented mind opener. <laughs> and there are ways to do that. You take the strange and you make it seem familiar to people and they go, oh my God. Or you take the familiar and you make it seem very strange and at that moment when their brain is in neutral, you can sing in the message. That's but neat. you do it better than I do. Another one from Jamais. What happens when good observers disagree? For example, one guy says it's just around the corner. The other guy says it won't happen for decades. Do you go with the guy who buys you the better dinner? Um, I'm open to offers. I haven't had dinner yet tonight. Um, no, I, to me, when people disagree, that's the cone of uncertainty. And, and when you hear the, and, and oftentimes, you know, it can indicate that the cone is getting very broad. Or it means that there's a choke point about to come where everything is collapsing into, you know, singularity is a bad, bad term, carrying lots of baggage, but things, you know, events collapse into a point where it all happens. Multiple voices are great. The more, the better. Well, that raises a question from Jim Corr, is it? Where are you? Over here. Um, how and when do you know the S-curve is shaped? Some are shallow, some are rather steep. What's, what's the early indicators of which one you're looking at? I don't know. Um, I spent a lot, this is, we should, we should meet for a beer afterwards. This gets kind of into deep geek part about forecasting. And this is actually something I'm looking at very closely right now, part of my work at Stanford. Um, I haven't found an effective way, except in a rough, heuristic, instinctive analogies to other things to figure out what, what the steepness is. And that's why all of the S-curves I drew were idealized S-curves. Don't use them as actual forecasts. Uh, by the way, uh, he also had a question uh, which is kind of interesting. Y2K 
uh, in some sense was a bust. I was one of the people who said it's going to be uh, the end of the world, and I was uh, hilariously wrong. I know. I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I'm still not convinced you're right about nuclear power. Either, no, Stuart. absolutely. Okay. Well, that'll be the end of the world. Hey, so what? We won't care, right? Okay. What? My problem with nuclear power, by the way, I think it's a great idea if we had enough Swedish engineers to run the plants, but... Well, thanks to us greenies, we, you know, there aren't any smart nuclear engineers anymore. Right. No, They're all true. in France, you know, but we can import French ones. All right, Y2K was a bust. Was that because the software developers solved the problem or because there actually was no problem? No, I think it was, it, it was the first. It was, it, um, you know, and, and I was in the middle of, at the time, I was advising a lot of IT departments and said, look at this interesting problem. You better handle it now. It's sort of like sailing a sailboat around an island. You know, if you make a small course change 10 miles off, it's a lot easier than making a big course change 100 yards off the reef. The longer you wait, the more expensive it's going to be to fix, and the more you're going to get slammed by your CEO. And, and you know, CIOs, they're the Rodney Dangerfields of management. They don't get no respect. I mean, think about this. Just digress. This was the real problem about Y2K is it was a lose-lose situation. If it collapsed, they would have gotten fired. If it didn't collapse, they would have said it was my... I mean, think of this. The CFO goes, CIO goes into the CEO's office in an ordinary company in this country, and he says, here's, let me tell you the details. And the CEO says, I don't need to know the details. Just tell me the bottom line. If a CEO did that to the CFO, walks in and said, you know, well, let me tell you about the financials. And he says, I don't need to know the details, just the bottom line. The CEO would be fired. So the real problem with Y2K is CIOs got no respect, but it was solved because a lot of people did a lot of hard work. But sadly and unfortunately, it distracted us from what the real issue was. And, and the, I, I did a, a column in Salon Magazine that the, the title was, Forget Your Computer, Worry About the Wacko Down the Street. And I got three death threats off of it from... <laughs> Actually, we ended up becoming very good friends with a guy who, as near as I could tell, lived two ridges over from where Ted Kaczynski lived, but it's another story. So what we have now is Y2K is an example of an accurate prediction, which was uh, self-canceling. Yeah, happens all the time. Okay. That's the whole point of predicting. You know, the whole point of mapping that cone of uncertainty is to steer yourself away from the bad things and towards the good things. So this is a way for forecasters to take credit when they're wrong. <laughs> it's worked for me for 20 years. <laughs> but you better have a credible case. I mean, if nobody had done anything to the computers and we hadn't had a problem, then, then we could have said Y2K wasn't a problem. But a lot of people did put a lot of man hours into it. Absolutely. And we got rid of a lot of legacy systems and upgrades and blah, blah, yeah. blah. Okay. And IBM sold a whole bunch of hardware. Yeah. <laughs> Keeps happening. Uh, Kevin Kelly asks, he's right here, how might our methods, this is a meta forecasting question, just what you need. How might our methods, say the one you just outlined of forecasting, change in the next 20 years? Is there any technology or culture that will change forecasting itself? Um, well, I think the biggest change is that we're going to end up having forecasters are going to have, professional forecasters are going to have lots of conversations with machines. And I think what's going to happen to forecasting is a little bit what happened to the natural sciences and biology in the 70s and 80s, you know, where today you can't be a PhD student in biology unless you're a computer jock, you know, and, and 30, 40 years ago, you didn't have to know computer stuff in biology. Um, yes, degree in biology, I'm in trouble here. Um, so for professionals, they're going to have lots more conversations with much more sophisticated tools. And for non-professionals, i.e. consumers of forecasts, they're going to have to understand more about what the tools are that the professionals are leaning on. And so I think we're going to, that inevitably is going to change the metaphors and change the conversation and the vocabulary of forecasting. Okay, biology. I don't think I satisfied him. Molecular biology is pretty predictive. That's, you know, everything's taking off in the area. I'm not like, saying it's the predictive, but I'm, listen, even, no, it is. even behavioral biologists, you know, ecologists are, they're carrying laptops out in the field, 
and they're pulling data and they're going to get sensors and all that. I'm not saying it's predictive, but I'm saying they're using the tools. Okay. Same thing for forecasters. You got my point. Ecology, I can promise you as an ecologist, is not predictive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, but they use lots of computers. Right. And we're headed in the... It it's makes getting, them feel good. It's getting that, and it's also getting more predictive. Yeah. Close call. <laughs> you should try this sometime, having a conversation with Stuart in front of 300 people. 200,000 people, actually. A lot of them are not in the Actually, room. the only thing, I, <laughs> only thing worse than this, Stuart, was I, uh, there's a little book I helped put together of some collection of E.B. White's essays. And, the editor called me and sweet talked me. He said, well, would you help? And by the way, would you do the introduction? And I said, sure. And 48 hours later, I went, what have I just done? You know, putting my words in front of E.B. White's. But then I remembered nobody reads introductions, so it wasn't a problem. <laughs> that was before video. Now everything's in there. Don Carlson. Dan Carlson? Dan Carlson, sorry. Uh, a couple of years ago, I discovered a list online of the top 100 world economies. 50 were countries and 50 were corporations. I figured that 50 years ago, all 100 would have been countries. Is this a trend? In 50 years, will they all be corporations? And if so, how many? <laughs> Wait a minute. The top 100 will be 100, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you would have to give me a little bit more time than we have, you know, in the 30 seconds. Um, to, to, to try and give you a number. Um, it is actually a subject I've thought about a fair amount. I've, I've actually taken that shift of corporate versus national economy size in a slightly different direction. Bear with me. Um, you assume that nation states will stay around. I don't. Um, uh, I, uh, I think the 20th century was we, without a doubt, this is a safe forecast, the 20th century was definitely the century where the nation state dominated international affairs. And in a strict legal sense, until the UDI, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that was true. Classical public international law, the only person to international law, person as an entity that's recognized as a nation state. I think what we're seeing, we have more nation states today than ever, but the nation state is beginning to fly apart. And I think it doesn't mean nation states are going to disappear, but political power at an international level, in my opinion, is shifting to a different body in this century, and that's the city state. And that city states are going to be the entities that call the shots, either directly as independent de facto or de jure city states like Singapore or, or Dubai, uh, or as de facto city states like Shanghai and Beijing. You know, China is an interesting place. The most powerful politicians in the country are the mayors. And, um, and eventually, you know. It's true here, too. And, it, and that's what I mean. It's true here, too. And let me give you an example. In this country, I, I actually think it's an open question whether the United States will exist in a recognizable form by the middle part of this century. Because we're flying apart. Juan Enriquez was here and he talked about the untied states. That was part of it. The other piece is we have a bunch of regions in this country that are already acting as independent city states. I mentioned, you know, the Bay Area in some ways is a city state, Southern California, LA, San Diego, California. A city state is a logical unit of size. It's big enough to have an impact in the international uh, marketplace. But it's small enough that everybody sees their relationship to the whole. And that's its power. And we have good examples. But just one extended example here from California. Arnold Schwarzenegger, two years ago, George Bush came to me and said, Arnold, I need your troops on the California border to protect us down to the Mexican border against uh, terrorists and illegal aliens. So send the National Guard down there. And what did the Republican governor of California say to the Republican president, a member of his own party? No. And what did he do a month and a half later? He held a press conference on the shore of San Francisco Bay with a real head of state, Tony Blair, announcing a joint alliance between California and the UK around a policy involving global warming in direct opposition to his Republican president. The United States is breaking up into city-states. 
I think it's inexorable. I think it's going to happen. The only uncertainty, and I'm spending a lot of time thinking about this now, is what does it do? Is it in kind of a soft, you know, Europeans are, you know, from Venus kind of approach, or is it in kind of a nasty, you know, Civil War style, Americans are from Mars and we can't get along? Um, that's the uncertainty. But your question to me really is what's the role of the city state and the spoiler? in that, and there's lots of complexity. I think there's some interesting conflicting forces going on here. You bet. I so completely agree with the urbanization overwhelm which is going on yeah, that's everywhere. Part of it. And yet, and yet. Uh, so that's sort of the opportunity. Space is being filled by cities in ways that nations can't keep up with, the communications and all these other things you're talking about. How about the problem space? Say Climate change is the major dominant, overwhelming, everybody's got to deal with it, how are they going to deal with it in problem space we're looking at over the next half century at least. Yeah. Cities are not going to be able to step up to climate. Who steps up to climate is basically four national elements, the European Union, the United States, China, and India. If those four governments, national governments, do the right thing, we might be okay. If they don't, we won't. Cities are not part of that story. Yeah. So what does that do to nationhood? Well, this is where the uncertainty comes in. I mean, this gets in, I, you know, it would be a very nice thing to have nation states say solid. It'd be nice maybe to have a global government that could handle some of these things and the like. But, you know, oftentimes events go in an opposite direction. Think about what Prop 13 did for this state and the disastrous consequences it had for education. And, and, and now today, the whole attitude of, about property ownership and this fundamentalist approach is, working against a lot of the global climate change stuff. And, and at all sorts of levels, you know, there are, I think the number is 70 uh, property owners on the Mexican-US border who are being sued by the federal government because they won't allow surveyors on the border to survey them for the border fence. So I would, I, I, you're okay, absolutely- So when my waterfront property is uh, completely swamped by rising sea levels, who do I sue? Uh, I don't know, um, but it probably won't matter. Um, <laughs> but there probably will be a That's lawyer. That's interesting. You know. you know, there will be lawyers around to uh, handle it. But this is the problem that the nation state is waning at exactly a time when we need national, we need national power and we need national presence. Um, there are more actors on, this, on the international stage, not less, and that's going to create confusion. Um, question from Ricardo. Ricardo is where? The greater, we're getting there, the greater the information environment, the greater the cone of uncertainty, right? What affects size of cones of uncertainty? I think is the larger question here. I'm not... When are they narrow, when are they wide? Um, it's not, you know, it's a heuristic, it's not empirical. Um, when they're really wide, you feel it, you just know it. Like when the Berlin Wall fell, that was a point as a forecaster where to me, you know, I, I took the advice of my mother. She said, there are times when children should be very small and very quiet, because it went to 180 degrees. Um, but barely six months later, in August, um, Saddam, uh, Saddam's tanks crossed the border into Saudi Arabia, and we did not go to DEFCON 2. And at that point, it was very clear what the order would be. And in my opinion, it, was, it, it marked the, the, the century really ended when Saddam's tanks rolled across the border because we had entered, ent we'd left the bipolar world and gone into a multipolar world, and then it was pretty clear what things looked like. So oftentimes, what I look for is that key indicator event that says, wait a second, something just changed. So was that a narrowing of the cone when you saw that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, one more from Kevin Kelly. I think we'll stop here. If the world is accelerating, by the way, that, at that comment, he wants you to know if you agree or disagree. I'm agnostic on this. Um, you know, is your agnostic agnosticism accelerating? <laughs> no. <laughs> what it is is the individual pieces. The re my hypothesis about why things take 20 years is because people are stubborn and they don't change their minds. You know, they form their ideas and they get 20 years on the stage to implement them. They get shoved off. And I haven't noticed that people have gotten any less stubborn. The acceleration effect we feel, in my opinion, is happening because more things are happening at once. 
And as a forecaster, the real change, I, again, this is, you know, I didn't want to bore you all tonight, the real change comes from the cross impact of multiple events reinforcing each other or dampening each other. It's not a sing, rarely a single event. And the acceleration effect we feel is it's just because there are more people and there's more going on. Um, and also, above all, you know, the difference between this moment in time and trying to put ourselves into the shoes of someone in 1914 is we know how it turned out for them. So we really can't understand what it was like to be them. We don't know how it turns out for us, and that gives us that giddying sort of pit in the stomach feel you get when you go down a roller coaster. And if we had perfect foresight and could see everything, then it probably wouldn't feel like such an acceleration. Well, the there's, technologies have self-accelerating or not capabilities. Uh, new yeah, cap individual, without a doubt. There are individual things that accelerate. Otherwise, we wouldn't have S-curves. The question to me is when it really nets, you know, net, net, bottom line for our life, when it really nets out, do we feel an acceleration? And I've talked to... Hmm. You know, someone a few, it was long, uh, some time ago, someone who was over 100 years ago, who had been through the changes of the late 1800s, you know, and sort of seen what, read Henry Adams' wonderful book, The Education of Henry Adams. Mm. You know, the chapter, The Virgin and the Dynamo. And, and also, you know, like all this acceleration stuff is almost become a religion. Uh, the quarter just started at Stanford mm -hmm. and I had my first class today. And the first reading I assigned to my class was an essay titled, The Law of Acceleration. It was not written by a Silicon Valley geek. It was written in 1904 by Henry Adams. So people have been going, wee, things are accelerating for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I can show you quotes from frustrated scribes mm -hmm. in 1503 going, wee, things are accelerating. So, mm -hmm. so I would just kind of, yeah, they're accelerating, but I, you know, there's this historic chauvinism that every, every human alive at the moment they've been alive has thought they lived in the most important time in history. And it was, because we didn't know how it would turn out, and we're no different. And, and we have the internet to remind us we're the most important in history. <laughs> Are we done yet? No, not quite. Let me, let me stay on your field on technology for a minute, because some technologies do not self-accelerate. Nuclear of uh, technology does not actually it does ah. three mile island um chernobyl <laughs> it can slow itself down yeah, but it, it can't know, expeed itself rods, it doesn't right. feed into its own research whereas computerly yeah. computer technology feeds into its own research yeah. biotechnology feeds into its own research nanotechnology which is becoming biotechnology feeds into its own research so they self-accelerate you suggested a minute ago that those things are intersecting. What happens when uh, a couple of exponential curves intersect? Do they become hyper exponential? What's going on? Uh, am I supposed to talk about the singularity now? <laughs> well, we've had a couple talks on the subject. One is saying, uh, you know, your future is a black hole. The other, yeah, uh, yeah, Chris no, Wells Law. That's right. And, and I, who was it who said the sing? Was it you who said the singularity will happen, but we won't notice? That's Danny Hillis. That was Danny. Okay. Um, also, let me put a pitch for another book in here. Kevin Kelly is working on a marvelous book, The Technium, <laughs> and he is going to actually answer this question. You know, they, this stuff is autocatalytic, without a doubt. The technologies do interact, and at times, you know, they own us. We don't own them. From biology, what we know is things that are autocatalytic. Oh, it's called cancer. Yeah, they right. break. They break. They yeah, break. They it's, break. it's not good. So, uh, innovation the, too is, you know. I think in biology, isn't innovation called mutation and mostly There is no legal? infinite J-curve, is that what you're telling us? They're all S-curves, whether we like it or not? Oh, actually, S-curves go down. The, the other piece there, yeah, yeah things, eventually, if things eventually level off. The reason why it looks like a big S-curve is that they interfinger. You know, I'm reminded of that marvelous story of the little old lady who went up to Carl Sagan in the basement at the Harvard Science Center after he'd given a talk, and she said, Sonny, I listened to your talk, but... You know, I know what it really is. It's the world is on the back of a turtle carrying it through time. And Sagan, you know, smart Cornell professor, he says, well, but what's the turtle on? And she says, another turtle. He said, what? He says, Sonny, I'm way ahead of you. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> well, big S curves are made of lots of little S curves, and they interfinger. And it would be cruel to go into details tonight, but that's why we get big S curves, because of the interaction of all the smaller S curves. All the way down and all the way up? I don't know yet. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.